here I'm coming from Saudi Arabia. Women cannot run for anything there. They don't even have driving lights. And here I'm running for state assembly. My mother taught us, take the best that your Arab culture has to offer and take the best of what your American home has to offer and put them together. And my grandfather, he said, if you think that fighting uh, for people's right is right, then continue that, continue that. Major funding for Arab American Stories was provided by Mohammed and Jamie El Arian, the Arab American Community of Michigan, the Arab American Community of Houston, Texas, the American Syrian Arab Cultural Association of Michigan. Additional funding was provided by American citizenship is coveted around the world. Teacher and educator Faryal Masri, lawyers Kareem and Nawar Shora, and union organizer Khalil Cade all feel a responsibility to uphold the precious rights granted to them as American citizens. As a child in Mecca, Saudi Arabia, Faryal Masri valued freedom and education. She left her native country to pursue both. She now teaches U.S. history and government at a public high school in Reseda, California, and is a passionate advocate for the American political system, having run four times for the California State Assembly. I've been teaching now, it's about 13 years. That was my passion. I know I love it because when I come to the classroom, I forget about the rest of the world. Anybody remember what civil uh, rights are? Civil right is the positive action taken by the government to protect the citizen. Teaching is reaching. That's what, to me, is the most important thing, is to teach, teach these kids, motivate them. I don't see anything, you know, doing anything except teaching or politics, because in a way, it is connected. People are free to print anything they want. One day, a friend of mine he called me and he said, we want you to run for state assembly. So I said, okay, so I decide to run. And I knew that everybody was laughing at me because they know, no way I'm gonna win. Nobody knows me, I have nothing. Uh, but I took it seriously. And I, one of the reasons I took it seriously, first of all, I thought it's an honor to run in a democratic system. I mean, here I'm coming from Saudi Arabia, uh, never been in politics. Uh, women cannot run for anything there. They don't even have driving lights. And here I'm running for state assembly. That's what you want more than that. The fact that she was out there on the campaign trail showing that she's a school teacher, she's actually a normal person just like everyone else uh, who believes in democracy just as much as any other American or maybe more so because Arab Americans appreciate, particularly Arab American women, pr appreciate the democracy that we have here I think more than people who necessarily grew up in it. Another thing which is really interests me in running uh, I will be the first Saudi, not just woman, woman or man, to run for office anywhere in the world. What I've been told when I went back to Saudi Arabia, they say the day they announce that you're running uh, for office in the royal palace, women and men were jumping, you know. They couldn't believe a woman from Mecca, from Saudi Arabia, running for office in America. It was unbelievable. I'm always interested in politics, but I never thought I'm gonna, I'm gonna be in politics because I'm, I'm an emotional person, I speak my mind, and that I thought, as a politician, I understood. Politician, you have to be a politician. You don't speak your mind. Even if you believe in something, you have to change the way you say it, and that's, I can't do that. When I was running for office, I knew that I'm not gonna win. But to me, it's, it's not winning, and a lot of people thought, it is crazy, I spent about 10 years fighting for something, I'm not gonna win it and spend my time and my money. And to them, this is a lost cause to, to fight. And, and I was really fighting for democracy. I am sorry to hear that you were not elected to the state assembly. Although you were not successful, you are to be commended for your dedication to your community. For me, it was run, running because I want to make a statement. As a teacher teaching democracy, 
I felt that a uh, lot of people taking democracy lightly. We, we're starting today with, with the idea is how to protect our system. We think that the best way to protect the system is people who are understand the system, willing to fight for the system. And that's what when we see Jefferson, he understood that democracy is not going to be protected until he educate people. I think it's wonderful for you at this age to start learning about something like that because it gives you the idea about involving in the system, that you don't feel hopeless, that you should really you know, help in protecting the system we like. When they asked me what I want to teach, I said I want to teach American history and American government. And they, I, a lot of people ask me why. I say there is nothing more wonderful than you know, b you know, for me to be an American is teach also and learn about America. You remember the First Amendment? How many freedom in the First Amendment? Five. 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 Five freedom. Now, some of those freedom very controversial, and it is very difficult to understand what is the limitation, what you have right, and what you you don't. Like for example, they g gave an example for that. They said. You cannot go to the, to the theater, for example, and, and start screaming, fire. What happened when you say fire? Exactly. Everybody will run, and that cause what? Chaos, and cause it could be somebody can die or somebody can hurt, because with freedom, it comes responsibility. And that's the beauty of being free. That's why you find a lot of people ready to die for their freedom. We see that in the Middle East now it's going, young women, men, uh, children are dying because they want to be free. So, so it is, we feel that we are really lucky to have this freedom. But the problem is some people, they don't understand how lucky and people take it for granted. I think one of the greatest achievement of this campaign for my people in district that I show them there is nothing called losing in a democracy. The beauty of the campaign or you know, the candidate is go through the journey. I was so lucky to, to be in this campaign and to, give it, to be given this opportunity. It's, it's hard, it's not an easy, it's hard, it's impossible. But it gave me the opportunity to learn about America. For the first time I, you know, in my life, I think I transferred from being a new immigrant to being real American. Everybody was American before me in my family. So we decided, you know, the day when uh, we have to go the, 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 taking the oath. And it was a moving, moving day in my life. I was, I, I, you know, I like crying. Yeah. It was, it was a very uh, nice because I know it's a commitment and it is, uh, it is for me to be the best American I can. I felt great after that. And I, you know, I decided to be, to be real, real American. And, and that's what I taught my kids. And I say, I want you to be the best American and the best Arab and the best Muslim. And that's, I remember even the, the, what I told my son when he went to Iraq. And, and I said, you're going there, but I always taught you not to be the ugly American when you go, to be the best American, to be the best Arab and to be the best Muslim. And, and that was my, you know, the way I looked at it. Kareem and Noir Shora were drawn to civil rights law to protect the liberties of innocent Arab and Muslim Americans after 9-11. They now use that experience to serve the entire American public in their respective jobs at the Department of Homeland Security. My mother taught us very early on. She would say, take the best that your Arab culture has to offer and take the best of what your American home has to offer and put them together. And I think it applies to Kareem and I. We took it to heart very early on. I remember coming here in fall of sixth grade. And the first few years, I remember hating it. In the mid-1980s, for a short, fat, hairy, Arab Muslim kid with a weird name, it wasn't the easiest. High school years were 
uh, initially very challenging. The uh, cultural difference between uh, the Middle East and West Virginia is, as, as you can imagine, uh, quite stark. You know, kids can be very mean anyway. I was picked on, I was beat up, I was called racial epithets. Add to it, I was one of maybe two Arabs or Muslims in the entire school, uh, one of maybe five minorities, period. My brother and I, we'd eat lunch together. We helped support one another. Freshman year in high school, something happened. And I was starting to make friends. I had shed my skin that I was the foreign kid, I was the Muslim kid, I was the short kid. And at the end of 10th grade, I decided to run for student body president. And I won. I was the first sophomore to be elected president. With Nawar, he somehow with this very funny name, got elected to be student body president in high school. He did it in Huntington, West Virginia. Later on in college, he's the one who got me into student government. And that's what first got me interested in, in sort of the legal policy world. My aim was immigration, public international human rights law. In law school, did international law, but also focused on cyber law, etc. I graduated law school in 2001, and I was going to go work for a dot-com in California or wherever it would take me. After law school, I decided to move to D.C., and that's when I became introduced to ADC. They wanted to be part of this advocacy group that uh, had been established way back in 1980 uh, to, to defend uh, the Arab American community. We were focusing most of our efforts on, on cultural issues at the time, uh, addressing stereotypes in Hollywood. I was unemployed, job hunting still, and I get a call from my brother saying, get to the nearest television, an airplane just hit the World Trade Center. And in my head, I'm, you know, that, you know, when your heart sinks into your stomach, and I'm thinking, please, God, don't let it be one of us. Within this society, as a people, as a faith, as a whatever, and this sets us back. I remember the feeling among the ADC staff was, what do we do? The organization, was by far the highest profile Arab, Amer Arab American organization in DC and nationally at the time. Um, and we knew we had to do something, but we didn't know what was that something. We started receiving the, uh, the phone threats uh, within an hour of the attacks taking place. The backlash started almost immediately, uh, not just with the immediate death threats and, and other bomb threats that we got at the office, uh, but, but nationally. I mean, restaurants were being uh, vandalized, uh, uh, schools were being threatened. It impacted us twice. I mean, we, we were attacked as Americans, and then we were attacked because we're Arabs or Muslims, or Arabs and Muslims, double whammy. No longer did I care about working for the latest startup and making lots of money. All of a sudden, having been a victim of a lot of discrimination and venom and hate and violence, I knew I needed to be on the front lines. I reached out to ADC. Uh, Kareem was already working there, and I knew that they were going to need the help. November 1st, 2001, I come on board full-time uh, as a legal advisor. We started helping individuals on the local level deal with discrimination and hate crimes, and later government programs that, that, uh, that um, violated civil rights being able to file lawsuits against major airlines uh, for, for, uh, for profiling. Well, I don't think at the time I realized how life-altering, not just for my life, but for us as a society, 9-11 was. And while it was a tragedy and great loss of life, the silver lining to come of that was that it forced people like me to step up. 9-11 forced us to say, no, this is, in, this is my country. And the beauty of our society that even if you disagree with the system, even if you uh, have challenges with it, you're free enough to engage it and fix it. I would guess by 2003, within, within two years, ADC was finally at a point where we were at the national stage of dealing with core civil rights issues 
for all Americans. We, as Arab Americans, as Muslim Americans, are not the first group to be them. Our society, our country, as great as it is, and I still think it's the best in the world, has always had a fear of the other. Our history says that. There's always a group. And now it's our turn. I moved to government first, but uh, very shortly thereafter, he also moved, uh, working on very similar issues, both civil rights, but he's still more on the training, cultural awareness side, and I'm still on, more on the dealing with the advocacy and the policy side. I'm proud to say I work for the U.S. government. I'm proud to say I know a number of Arab Americans and or Muslim Americans in a broad range of service to their country, whether on the Hill, in law enforcement, in the intelligence community, whatever it might be, in military, and I'm proud to say that. Khalil Cade is a labor organizer for hotel housekeepers in San Francisco, California. When Khalil's father and grandfather first came to California from Yemen, they worked in the fields, and Khalil grew up hearing stories of the Yemeni labor heroes who fought for their rights alongside Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers. He takes inspiration from them on his daily rounds of employee break rooms in San Francisco's fine hotels. The reason we're doing this action is because the Hyatt is hosting a conference inviting all the employers to teach them how to subcontract our jobs, local two jobs. And we're going to continue this action until 7 o'clock. We had about over 530 workers yesterday, and today hopefully we could have uh, more workers because the message will spread. Uh, in the uh, hotel industry in San Francisco, and we will have more participation. My name is Khalil, and I am from Yemen. I was born in Yemen. I'm an organizer uh, involved in labor movement for Unite Here Local 2 in San Francisco. My assignment today is going to be from 8 until 10 o'clock, and I'm going to be um, uh, doing exactly what you're hearing right now. I'm gonna be a shanter. When I see customers, guests coming uh, to check in, I'll tell them not to check in. I'll tell them check, uh, check out now, don't check in. The uh, workers will repeat after me, check out now. Who's on the street, local to, who's gonna fight local to, and who's gonna win? They repeat after me, local too. I'm gonna grab the mic right now and start chanting. There are not a lot of, I, I could say, not a lot, lot of Yemenis in San Francisco. The majority of Yemenis came from a background of farmer workers back in, in our uh, country. When they first come here, they all go to the farm and start, that's their start, uh, their start job. It's the same work. So that's, it's no shame to work, to continue. As a janitor, that's a shameful uh, for them. It was a shameful uh, uh, work to do, to clean. I have a huge family, you know, my dad, my mom, I've been married for a long time, over 35 years. My grandfather, I, lo I love my grandfather. Uh, he died uh, about eight months ago. Uh, he was with me in every step. His name was Hassan. He is one of the greatest. And my grandfather, he said, if you think that fighting uh, for people's right is right, then continue that, continue that. I got my citizen, citizenship when I was maybe 12 years old. That's when I got my citizenship. And I got my citizen and I swore at the same time my grandfather gets hit. 
same day we swore together. The majority of people and uh, local too, uh, workers are the housekeepers. You're gonna see a lot of them after four o'clock. I have the Spanish and Chinese uh, leaflets that I'm going to uh, pass into uh, in the Palace Hotel cafeteria. So I gotta remind them and tell them to go to the actions because we gotta push people to participate more. It's very hard to get involved with the unions because they get harassed by the employer, intimidated. Um, maybe that could lead to a discipline, uh, disciplinary actions or, um, or a terminations. That's why we're here as an organizer, to educate and to pass the message that it's okay to fight for your right. And that's our, and that's our message. I can't go from here, but I'll have to go around from the employee entrance and I'll have to sign with the security just to let them know that local two is present. For me, voting, of course. Um, if I could, I don't remember missing any vote, so I always vote, I'm always there. This is my everyday entrance. This is where the employees come in and out. And um, I come here, the security is down the stairs, so I'll have to go and check with them. But in, I encourage all the Yemeni people to get involved in voting. It's very important because politicians don't look at us because they love us. No, it's, it's because we vote. If they see votes and they count every vote, that's what's come for politicians. That's power. Done. Talk to the members. They're happy. Pass the message and deliver it well. Now, uh, some of them are still working, but they'll be there after their shift ends. Vote. Voting is power. We really need uh, politicians to respect us, us a Muslim uh, Arab Americans. It's time. My name is Munira Maya Sharad. I'm on the faculty in the Department of Sociology at the University of Texas in Austin. I mean, I think what's been really remarkable about uh, the Tunisian, Egyptian, Libyan uprisings has been to see the role of women in them. We've seen women really at the forefront of some of the protests. Uh, we've seen women uh, with banners in demonstrations, um, some women involved even in fighting in Libya. Th that is something that one did not necessarily expect. It's a, a sort of very complex situation where they, I think the American students do not totally abandon whatever stereotype they had. But at the same time, when they see the women at the forefront of protest, that really shatters their previous understanding. Some are simply mesmerized, and um, some just really have to make an effort to change their conception. They continue to feel, however, that, uh, that, that as long as women are veiled, that there is something that is a bit oppressive in there. It's very difficult, I think, for American students here to believe that um, one can be veiled and uh, very active in one's life. I think it's, a, it's really a historic moment in the entire region that calls upon people. It's very difficult to remain indifferent when something like this happens. As an academic from Tunisia, I really want to do the best I can to understand what's happening, and I feel that I have a responsibility also to speak about it because I am in a, in a particular position, being from there, being in touch with what's going on there, working in an American university. I feel a very important responsibility 
to um, to share in the discourse about the Arab Spring and to give the, whatever understanding I have to contribute that to the pot of understandings. I am Neda Ulabi. Hope to see you next week for more Arab American stories. Major funding for Arab American stories was provided by Mohammed and Jamie El Arian, the Arab American Community of Michigan, the Arab American Community of Houston, Texas, the American Syrian Arab Cultural Association of Michigan. Additional funding was provided by 